Are we live? Are we on? We're live. Welcome back. Yeah. I'm Chris Northrup. I am a clinical professor and I direct the Juvenile Justice Clinic at Maine Law. And we have an outstanding panel today. I'm very excited about hearing what they have to say. And my direct love is, is Sophie McMullen. So she is a formerly justice involved youth, and actually, it's not quite formally. She still has um, a, a piece of action with the, uh, the justice system in, in the form of, of restitution. Sophie has been volunteering and working for a number of years with New Inside Out, which is an amazing group of formerly incarcerated youth that do lots of things, including amazing spoken word and theater and lots of community outreach, it's a really wonderful group. She also is, more recently, a youth fellow working with the, the Musty School. Christine Tebow, on, on the left of Sophie, she is um, an assistant district attorney specializing in juvenile work. She's been doing that in Portland for a number of years. But since we are at Maine Law, I'm gonna be talking about all of her wonderful Maine Law connections. She, of course, is an alumna and she is a frequent contributor to the juvenile law class. We rely on her expertise and her judging abilities when, when we do arguments. We also see Christine very, very frequently in court in Augusta and at, at policy tables. And we often work together. Sometimes we are great allies. And occasionally, we are hopefully, well, She's always a worthy opponent, hopefully we are a worthy opponent as well. <laughs> Whitney Lawless, who you met briefly during her five minute spiel, she's a third year law student. She is the juvenile justice fellow at, at the clinic, which means that I've had the uh, pr pleasure and privilege of working with her for a full year. And in that position, she's been able to do a lot of direct representation, and she ran to Sophie doing direct representation, but she also gets to do a lot of policy work and I think that her working with Sophie did lead to this particular policy project. <coughs> Reginald Parson, he may have done more varied and wonderful experiential learning than, than anyone else. I'm going to well through it pretty quickly. It's a lot. So he was a student attorney last semester at the Juvenile Justice Clinic. He was a Maple Fellow at the Maine Division Defense Council. He um, is currently doing an externship in the city manager's office here in Portland. He works with the Police Citizen Reviews of the city. Did I get that right? And you were, um, spent a summer at the ACLU. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, I didn't do all that in one year. <laughs> <laughs> and he, yeah. he even went to a class occasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to start our conversation out with, with Sophie, because you know this piece of legislation really all started with you. So if, if you don't mind sharing, we would love to hear a little bit about what got you into the system and what keeps you in the system, and perhaps a little bit about Maine Set Out and your work with them. Definitely. Um, well, I guess what's really important to me is like it all goes back to like what my crime was originally, and I was I was incarcerated. Um, I was committed inside of Long Creek Youth Development Center when I was 16 years old um, for being, I was dating this boy who was 20 and him, he was doing burglaries around where I was and I was an accomplice, I knew about it and he got nine months in county and then two years probation and I got um, almost three years in Long Creek. and. Um, at first, I was trying to get out and do a program. I was really trying to stay in my community and I was fighting so hard they didn't want to do that. But finally, they wanted to give me um, a chance to be able to go out and remain in my community and try to do that and to make sure, um, instead of being committed, and to be able to do that, I, they, need, they put a restitution in place for me. Um, and restitution, a certain amount of money, it was like, I think mine was around like 4000 5000 something like that. And then I got sent to um, a residential where I did not get kicked out or anything. Um, actually, my probation officer at the time was really trying to keep me in the community, but ultimately, 
there was nowhere to put me, which is why I was committed in the first place. And there, um, and that doesn't just knock just because I wasn't able to have that, um, have the chance that I really wanted in the community to stay out there. Instead, I got sent to this group home that just wasn't, um, didn't work for me, and they. Um, <coughs> And they, they said, like, this isn't the place for you. You didn't do anything wrong for us to just kick you out, but like we think you would do better elsewhere. And since there was nowhere else to put me, I got committed, and therefore that restitution stayed with me um, the whole time I was committed. And so then when I got out of Long Creek, I got out of Long Creek with at 20 years old. And I was, I had no insurance, I had never had a job before in my life. I was homeless. There was I had nowhere to live. I was living at the teen center in Portland. And I like and I honestly forgot about the restitution for a while until one day I got picked up um, when I was homeless. Cops ran my name and I had a warrant. And I didn't know what this warrant was for and it was because I hadn't been paying my restitution for three years when I wasn't in, inside that whole time. And so I was like, oh great, so now I'm going back, now I'm going to county, I'm already in a position, I'm not causing any crimes or anything, or doing anything illegal and I'm homeless, but now I'm going to jail otherwise because I can't, I forgot about this restitution and now I have to freaking catch up. And that was really stressful for me. And I, um, I, I got, I, when I was on the inside, I became part of a nonprofit organization that creates original theater for youth that has been incarcerated. Our all-time goal is to abolish youth incarceration and mass incarceration in general. And that is Main Inside Out. And between Main Inside Out and the teen shelter, I got involved with the Cumberland Legal Aid Clinic. Um, because obviously I needed a lawyer to get through this whole restitution thing. I was now going back to jail again. And, um, and I, we were going, we were trying like, okay, you're homeless, you know what I mean? Obviously that's a lot of money and like we need to figure out at, like see if we can get this like, like taken off, you know what I mean? Like you didn't even get to stay out and use it and this is still hanging over your head and affecting you, and you have so much more to worry about. You know what I mean? You done the, you. I did the time. Well, they say you do the crime, you do the time. Well, I did do the time. So like, why? And I was a kid, and now I so, and now I still have like thousands of dollars to pay. But I am, and, and when we went in there, we were thinking that we were at least going to be able to like lower that amount. You know what I mean? It just seems. Seems reasonable. Well, no. Um, actually, there's a law in place where I'm going to keep going to jail. I have to keep paying until that is done. Um, or I will be in trouble for it. I will be sent back to jail. And unless a law is changed for in situations like my own, it's dismissed or something. Or whatever needs to happen with that happens. As it's really, it does hold people back. Kid, it does hold kids back. And um, now I'm expecting my first child, and I'm doing a lot better now. And it's like, thanks for the help of like the people who are around me. But it's like, now I still have that hanging over my head. You know what I mean? And like, it really got me to the place. Now I can make some payments. It's still really hard. It's still really hard. And honestly, like. I, ha I have so much to pay, like I have so much to buy, so much to get. I'm still waiting on my housing to be able to afford something. I just recently was in a sober house to get my, get my life back on track. And so I had to like, I was working three jobs just to be able to afford that. And then I was paying my restitution at the same time. You know, it's just so difficult and it's just like, and like so like and sometimes you just need like that help you know what i mean or like someone to listen or just like that to take it into consideration that i was punished for that why am i still being punished so 
It's just that that is a big thing that people don't think about and don't hear about, like, and don't take into consideration, like, with the restitution. Like, it's it's really like it's been a problem for me since I got out, and I'm trying. I'm really like fighting against it. And it's been a problem for a lot of other juveniles. So I'm hoping we can we can figure this out. Let, let me turn it over to Whitney on that because she's been, been working very hard on, on trying to piece together some legislation that, that might help folks who are in, in your yeah. situation. Absolutely, yes. So Sophie's absolutely right. Um, you know, there are a couple of flaws in the law that I, that I hope to change and that Reggie and I have been working on. So um, took a look at the law, we put together a proposed amendment, and um, we want to strike the language that allows a youth to obtain a more favorable outcome of their case if they have an ability to pay restitution. So we're just going to want to strike that language just right out. Um, that would put all types of youth on equal playing fields. Um, something else we want to do is we want to put in a cap for the amount of restitution that the court can order. Um, something that would be an attainable amount for the youth instead of these excessive, burdensome amounts. Um, and then additionally, we want to prohibit the incarceration of youth. So right now, the law allows for incarceration if they do not pay. Um, and that just needs to be, that, that needs to end. Um, so generally, those are, those are the highlights. Oh, and, and we, would, we would say that there should be a preference for community service in lieu of monetary restitution. Um, that way there, the juvenile is still held accountable. Um, and the victim is, is also feeling like their rights are being um, accounted for as well. So I think it would be the appropriate balance. Right. Christine, I know that we've shared this legislation through its draft form and into it. It's, it's not out as a bill yet, but will likely be out of the, officially out of the revisor's office sometime next week. And I know that you have significant concerns with this legislation, and we would like to hear those concerns and see if there is middle ground or see if it, where you think this should wind up. Yeah, I think there, there's always middle ground, right? Uh, I think the piece that I don't want people to lose sight of is if you believe in restorative justice, and I'm willing to bet that 99.9% .9 of the people in this room strongly support restorative justice, you have to preserve the interests and the rights of victims, who, by the way, in juvenile court are often youth themselves, are often people of limited means. So there is another avenue to this uh, as well, which is what are we doing to care for people who have been victimized? Um, with all due respect to Whitney, I, I don't believe that community service benefits a victim. There are many victims that we speak to, and I wish I had kept this data, I don't. There are many victims that we speak to that say, I don't want restitution, and they don't ask for restitution. But when they do, it's usually for a very legitimate purpose. And uh, it's my experience, which is very long in the juvenile court, is that judges are far more likely to impose restitution obligations for private citizens than they are for uh, businesses or insurance companies. They typically don't get restitution. So I think you know, I, what I would like to bring to the table, to the discussion, is what are the victim's interests? What are the victim's rights? And how do we make sure that that doesn't get lost in the process? Uh, in my experience, again, I can only speak to my experience in the Cumberland County Court, is youth who get arrested for failing to pay restitution, it's not the failure to pay that gets them arrested. It's the failure to come to court when they're ordered to come to court. And maybe there's a way to do that by, for example, allowing attorneys to stay appointed to youth while they continue to have a restitution obligation so that that youth can uh, keep in touch with their lawyer and the lawyer can remind them of their court dates. Uh, there are ways, I think, around that, uh, but I have never seen a youth locked up at Long Creek or at County Jail because they didn't pay the money. They were confined because they didn't respond to the court order to appear. So. Well, I'm, I'm going to pick one thing out of that because post disposition representation, I think, is, is so incredibly important for youth and it's something that Maine doesn't have. So once 
your case is, is disposed, whether you go to Long Creek, whether you go on probation, no matter what happens to you, your attorney, their job is over, and they are, are cut from your case, and often that's when you need the political support the most. Reggie, you are our local policy expert, and I, I think that we, we've heard there, there are some very strong victim interests here, there are some very strong interests in, in youth when they are an adult, being out of the system, cutting all ties with the system. Can you give us a little analysis on, on if there's any way that these policies can come into agreement or is just they're always going to be in, in contention with each other? Um, I think there might be some, like a healthy you know tension with each other because obviously there's money involved and there's people who actually you know feel victimized or have been victimized by one you know incident regarding juvenile um, but in thinking about this you know for when I had um, my client he was 15 to 16 years old um, and yeah he was imposed restitution you know it was a substantial amount for a 15 year old it, and their parents couldn't afford to help them pay. So that that has to be a significant amount of stress. And, and going to Sophie's point, it's like sometimes you just forget because as a juvenile, there's so many other things you you worry about. And the one thing that you know sometimes you forget is like, oh, I have a restitution that I have to pay and I can get in trouble for failure to pay. And maybe nobody told me up front that that could, that could actually happen. So. Um, I do believe that victims do have a, a say and, you know, sometimes they just want to be heard, sometimes they actually want compensation. But at the same time, they have to also think about it's a teenager. They can't work. They should be focusing on school for the most part. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a balance, I think. All right. So if he's asked for just a, a moment before we start opening up for questions, so the floor is yours. I just want to say um, that I, like with the um, like with victims and stuff, yeah, that's that's where it's like the hard part and the sticky part, you know. But I just want to put out there, like a lot of the times I've heard, and personally in my case, my the my the person who I was with the crime, the guy I was dating at the time, he did not have restitution or anything to pay, and I wasn't going to until. Um, I wasn't going to until I got the chance to try to get out early. And I, again, I did not get any charges and I ultimately got committed because there was nowhere to put me. So this wasn't put in place as a punishment. This wasn't even going to happen until I wasn't going to, the restitution wasn't put in place for a punishment or for the victim. It, was, it wasn't even going to happen until I was given the chance to get out, but I didn't even really get that chance. Can, can I test some audience knowledge? Well, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's audience participation time anyway, so yeah. it's a great, great way to break into it. So, I, I collected some data. I collect data on restitution from my office only. Uh, I can only speak to Cumberland County. And I recognize fully that practices in juvenile courts vary throughout the state. So what's true in Portland may not be true in Prescott. Isle. But um, I just want to ask folks, you know, what do you think, what percentage of youth that come to the juvenile court do you think are ordered to pay restitution? And then I'll share the data from doesn't yeah. depend on the crime. I mean, if they took something worth of value, then that value is taken into consideration for restitution. But if they maybe did assault, that wouldn't necessarily be restitution. Yeah, but I'm just, just generally speaking, of all of the kids that we see in Cumberland County Juvenile Court, what percentage of those youth do you believe are probably ordered to pay some sort of restitution? 20, 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. Last year, 2018. 11 youth were ordered to pay restitution, 3.3%. The high year was 2016, 7.9%. So, I mean, I think, I think that reflects some ability of the court to make those inquiries about who is able to pay, who's not. Judges, prosecutors, we're people, we get it wrong sometimes. Um, so I'm not gonna sit here and say it's, it's a very it, flawless system. But 
Um, I think overall, the, the juvenile courts do make a fair inquiry about who has an ability to pay. I have one more question for you. Of the youth that are ordered to pay restitution, what percentage do you believe actually pays the restitution in full? Ten. What? Uh, what? One percent actually pays? Eighty percent? Who said eighty? Is this an implicit Seventy-eight percent. Yeah. And that's, and, and in fairness to my data, that includes 2018 kids who are probably still paying, so they haven't had a chance to pay in full. So a vast majority of the youth are ordered to pay obligations that they really can meet. So again, I think that reflects some of uh, some of the practices in the board. If I could just comment, I think, you know, Teva is great sometimes, it's great that we have this, but you know, I think we're, we're forgetting a couple of different factors here. You know, we don't know what the youth's um, family circumstances was like. Perhaps they came from a well-off family, and if that's the case, then of course they could make the restitution. Um, and, that, and that's exactly what we're trying to resolve with this bill. All right, well, so I'm going to open it up to, to questions. <laughs> I, I will ask that you direct your question to somebody particular on the panel, and we have a hard stop in about nine minutes. So if you three, that would be great. I can start with the group, and we'll go this way. Um, I have a question for Whitney. Um, I her story was interesting, comparing it to the facts that you also gave. I am wondering what exactly are the factors that judges take into consideration when they determine that this you can pay restitution. Sure, yeah, so that's actually one of the things that we would like to change with this law. We want there to be a youth-based standard in how the court can determine an inability to pay. Right now, um, they're, they're dealing with it the same way that the adult court would assess it. And it, that, I mean, we have a juvenile court for a reason, and it should have a, a well-tailored um, standard in order to reflect the differences between adults and minors. So right now, they don't really go into a you know. I don't think it's thorough enough. They don't really account for, you know, do you have a job? Um, and, and will this restitution obligation take you away from school? Will it take you away from your family life? They don't consider all of that in full. And that would be the, the, the juvenile statute, what it does is it says, says you should look at the adult statute when you're determining restitution. So it just is, it passes right over into the adult statute. Scott, do you have a question? And um, who? Um, you had mentioned um, when Sophie, about Sophie talking um, a part about kids not going to court. Um, how do you expect them to go to court if they're homeless and to be able to know about court if they're on the street trying to survive? And how do you expect them to pay restitution if they're just trying to live day by day? <laughs> That's a fair point, and um, you know that is one of the challenges that we have in juvenile court is staying in touch with kids who are transient for a whole host of reasons. That's why I think it's important that we <coughs> continue to have a lawyer. Um, we do the best. The courts, you know, once that obligation gets entered by the court, the courts are the ones that reach out to kids and try to send them notices. If they have a lawyer, the notice goes to the lawyer. But you're right, if they move, it doesn't happen. Um, if we know that a youth is homeless, or if they're in, certainly if we know that they're incarcerated somewhere else, we let the judge know that and say, don't put out a warrant for this youth. We know that there, you know, there are circumstances that it wouldn't be fair for them to be arrested. But sometimes we just don't have any information at all. Um, and that's when those warrants get issued. Helen. Oh. Just a question. Um, no, no, first you have to introduce yourself because you're a total <laughs> I'm trying to be. I'm <laughs> um, I'm Colin O'Neill. I'm the Associate Commissioner for uh, Department of Corrections. It's a great uh, debate to hear a talk. Um, has there, is there any history or any data so those of you um, that actually go back to court? Um, so that may have representation and all that. And to argue for continued representation where restitution is discontinued or forgiven. Um, is there any experience for anyone in this room, attorneys or whatnot, that that's happened? I've seen cases where attorneys have filed requests to have, <coughs> excuse me, restitution obligations discharged. And my 
position with the court has been allow me to notify the victims. The victims were present at this position. That's their right. They have a right to be heard. And uh, frankly, when we reach out to the victims, I can only recall them saying, that's OK. I don't mind if that. I think one was upset about the fact. But once the victims have had that opportunity to be heard as well, then it's up to the court to make that determination on the discharge of restitution. So it's pos it certainly is possible. But it, it has to be done by agreement. There is no statutory fix. Okay. When, when it's done, it's, and, and you know, thankfully, Christine and judges are, are willing to not require statutory fix. But there, there is no law to do this. It, it is done informally. And, and without sanction, but it, it does happen. Yes. So I know that the data in terms of the percentage of youth that were ordered to um, pay the restitution was relatively low for the area, and that the um, percentage of those youth who had followed through with those payments was relatively high. But it seems to me like the that that data seems like kind of a confined litmus to measure a court's ability to successfully determine a reasonable amount for a youth to pay. Are there any models out there that have, I guess, a, a broader viewpoint when they're making that assessment? Or are there any ideas about potentially adjusting that assessment potentially for other court systems that might not have that successful data? That yes. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of models in other states, I'm going to defer to, to Whitney and Reggie because they may know of other models. I actually like the idea of the weighted um, analysis. I, I think that's a fair analysis to give. Um, my experience is that judges are often remiss to impose restitution when they know that youth doesn't have any ability to pay. And more off, I wish I kept data on the amount that the victims are requesting and then the amount that the courts actually impose. And I, I haven't captured that. But, um, or the net, more importantly, the number of um, cases where there has been a significant loss and the victim has said, no, that's okay, I really just hope this kid gets the help they need so that they don't repeat this behavior. That probably would be a very surprising number for most people. Um, so oftentimes, even though victims are entitled to restitution, they don't necessarily ask it. And, and the statute uh, prohibits us asking for restitution obligation without the victim's consent. So, Reggie Whitney, are there other state models that you looked at when you were putting together this legislation? Are there other yeah, states there that are. do it in a different way? I mean, with respect to other states, um, actually, there's been a lot of research on this um, the debtor's prison for kids, um, and you know, a bunch of other reports that have inspired different types of models. Um, there's one in Florida. It's called Project Payback. So, it, what happens is. Um, Youth who have been ordered to pay restitution work with other youth who have been ordered to pay restitution, and they work together um, in the community, and they learn skills and, and other things, and they make their restitution obligation. And then there are other places that are trending towards capping the amount. Um, so in, I think, it's either Wisconsin or Minnesota, um, for those under the age of 14, it's capped at $250. So. Uh, Sophie, or I'm sorry, Christine. So um, you pointed out some some conflicts you have where you have to represent the victims, and you do care about the victims receiving their sort of restitution um, to kind of compensate and make them whole from the crime that they committed. Um, I noticed in the, the proposed legislation that there was um, removing the um, <coughs> the restitution where you can uh, provide restitution in lieu of a prison sentence. Do you feel that that is? Um, appropriate or uh, functional? Well, let me frame the question a little differently. Thank you. So, <laughs> there, there is a provision that a factor of whether you get in, in a secure confinement sense is whether you pay restitution or not. So, it, 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 you, sometimes you can buy your way in that as a factor of, of whether you get secure confinement or not. Is, is that a fair factor to have in the statute? You know, it could be removed because it's never used. In my experience, um, over two decades in the juvenile court, I can honestly say that, and I would be shocked, maybe people in the room wouldn't, but I'd be shocked if any prosecutor in the juvenile court said, um, gee, if you pay the restitution, I won't ask for period of confinement. And that to me is unconscionable, and I would never do that. Be because 
it shouldn't be an either or. That's not how you get restitution. You know, that's not a fair factor. So, I mean, removing it from the statute, <coughs> frankly, in my opinion, would be would be immaterial. I think the way, and I, I printed it, but I want to take the time to look at the statute now, but I think what it's looking, when a judge has to make a decision on whether somebody should be ordered to do a period of confinement, they look at things like remorse and whether they've um, made amends and atoned with the victim for their, their wrongdoing. So I think in that sense, I understand why it's in the statute, but, but honestly, um, I can't imagine any juvenile prosecutor saying, if you pay the restitution, I'm going to give you, I, I'm not going to ask for you to be confined. <clears throat> All right, one more question and then we'll get up. Send everybody out. I was going to ask for A.D. Thibodeau or for either of the, the two students. Do you have an, uh, an idea, either data or anecdotally, what a normal, like, average amount of restitution is when it is ordered? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so, over the past five years, I can tell you that five to $100 obligation, 21 times, 100 to $250, 34 times, 250 to $500, 23 times, 500 to 1,000 dollars, 39 times. So that's a, that's a pretty big chunk. And obligations of over 1,000 dollars were ordered 15 times. And yeah. one of my my former client was in that last category. All right. So it's 5:30. I've got a hard stop. We're going to break. Please come by the posters. There's going to be a couple other youth from Maine Inside Out. Um, say hello. Ask some questions. Thank you very much.